Thanks, Steve. Uh, first wanted to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to this great conference and to mention that everything I'm about to say is joint work with my collaborators, Kurt McMullen and, and Alex Wright. Um, so our main theorem uh, is there is a primitive totally geodesic complex surface uh, F uh, in M13, the moduli space of genus 1 Riemann surfaces with three marked points. Um, and I'll spend most of my, my talk discussing this theorem. Uh, before uh, I get to describing F, let me make a few remarks about what all of these terms mean. Is my font size all right in the back? Yeah? OK. Um, uh, so M, M13, MGN is the moduli space of genus G Riemann surfaces with n marked points. So a uh, point in MGN is a pair AP consisting of a Riemann surface A and a subset P of size N. Uh, and to talk about geodesics in MGN, we need to have a metric on MGN, and there's this metric DT called the Teichmuller metric. When I say F is totally geodesic, I mean for the Teichmuller metric. Um, every tangent vector the moduli space uh, generates what's called a complex geodesic. By which I mean a map, FV, from the hyperbolic plane into MGN, uh, which is holomorphic, complex, and locally isometric. Or if you want, the image is totally, totally geodesic. Um, so, uh, uh, and it's uniquely characterized by the property that the value at i is the base point AP, and the first derivative at i is the tangent vector V. And we'll come to this a little bit later, but uh, if you were here last week, I believe there was a discussion of dynamics over the moduli space of translation surfaces, and this is closely related to an SL2R action on the moduli space of translation surfaces or quadratic differentials. Now, if you start with a random vector uh, in tangent vector to MGN, uh, you will get a complex geodesic which, which, um, which evenly distributes itself in moduli space. Its closure will be all of MGN. Um, uh, but maybe if you start with a special tangent vector, you'll get, you'll get some complex geodesic with a small image. Um, so we'll say a subvariety, and so if you took a subvariety of MGN, an algebraic subvariety of MGN, and took a tangent vector to it, typically you'd expect that that tangent vector would not stay within that subvariety, but visit all of moduli space and uniformly distribute in there. So we'll call a subvariety totally geodesic if the opposite happens. Um, if every tangent vector little v to v uh, has the image of the associated complex geodesic uh, contained not, in, not uniformly distributed in MGN, but actually contained in v. Um, um, 
So our, our complex surface F, it's two complex dimensional. Uh, M13, uh, I'll just remind you, is three complex dimensional. So this is a hypersurface in M13, and it's um, totally, totally geodesic. There are two well-known sources of uh, totally geodesic subvarieties. Uh, the first arises from covering constructions. We'll come back to these later, but these give rise to V um, commensurable with other moduli spaces. MHK for some smaller H and K than G and N. And these are the not primitive examples. So when I threw the word primitive into that theorem, that's to say that there's no right for you to expect V, v to be there. Um, a typical example is if you looked at the locus in MGN where of, of Riemann surfaces stabilized by a particular element of the mapping class group. Uh, you'd get a totally geodesic subvariety coming from a covering construction. And then, then there's a, another source of examples. Um, there's the Teichmuller curves, which are the one-dimensional examples. Uh, the first one was discovered by Veach, my colleague at Rice, um, and now there's a, a longer list of them um, and a beautiful literature that's emerged around them. Um, but our example fits into neither of these two categories. It's, it's higher complex dimensional, and, it's, uh, and it doesn't arise from one of these covering constructions. With, what's that? It, it means covering, coming from a covering construction. Sorry, primitive means not coming from a covering construction. So the, the, the ones that come from a covering construction are, are, are not primitive, and our surface does not come from such a construction. Okay. The typical example, so in M13, there's a locus, there's an involution on every genus, genus one surface, and you can ask that the three points be invariant under that involution. If you look at the locus of such configurations, you'll get a totally geodesic complex surface is M13, but it's really coming from a lower genus uh, moduli space. Okay. So when I say it's primitive, I mean it doesn't come from that, that construction. Other questions? Okay, so um, also our surface F has a beautiful connection to the theory of plane cubic curves, um, as alluded to by, by this figure, which I'll shortly explain. Um, so let me, let me tell you a bit about that. So I want to tell you about plane cubic curves and what I'll call solar configurations. Um, so for any genus one Riemann surface without marked points, uh, there is a polynomial F in C adjoint X, Y, Z, homogeneous of degree three, uh, such that A is isomorphic to the zero set of F in P2, the set of points um, Q in P2, where F of Q equals zero. This is a classical fact you can prove using um, uh, the Weierstrass P function, say. Um, so in, in, in the conferences I usually go to, in flat surfaces, there's, there's usually a fight at the beginning of the conference between people who like to draw uh, uh, Riemann surfaces like this and people who like to draw Riemann surfaces like this. So this picture, a lot of that picture, is the set of real zeros of the polynomial F, and it's related to, to this picture by you take the real points of some complex, complex Riemann surface. Um, now, if I fix a point S in P2, uh, that's not an A, Uh, 
And then this gives rise to a degree three map on it. So this is, this is the zeros of f, the real points of the zeros of this thing. Um, uh, this point s gives rise to a degree three map on A, uh, pi sub s, uh, which is just projection from s. And this is, so this is a map from A to um, uh, P1, where this P1 is intrinsically the space of the projectivization of the tangent space to P2 at S, uh, i.e. the lines through S. And this is a, this is a degree three map. So if you take If you take a line through S, it'll meet the curve A at three points, and these three points are mapping all to the same point on, uh, 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 under, under this map. Um, what's that? Uh, absolutely. It, it, um, in fact, there, so a typical line meets meets this curve at three points. But if you start with a special line, it might meet the curve only in two points. Okay. So the critical values, I need, I need a little more space here. Let's, so the critical values of pi s uh, are the lines through S and tangent to A. The critical points of pi S are just the points of tangency. And the critical, um, and then the co-critical points are the other, other intersections with, the, with these critical lines. So um, right here is a critical point. And this right here is a co-critical point. In the celestial analogy, if you think of S as the sun and A as the earth, then these lines correspond to lines where it's, um, where it's dawn, some, some point where the sun is rising on earth. Um, and these points are codon. Uh, sorry? I, absolutely, um, and in that case, uh, so, so I, and and that occurs exactly when the dawn equals the codon point. Um, yes. So if if the line happens to meet the curve to to order three, then I then the dawn point and the codon point are, are the same. Okay. Um, it's it's also easy to compute. So by Riemann Hurwitz, there should be six of these. And actually, it's easy to compute where they are. Um, there's, a, there's a conic called the polar of the NS, and it's given by the very simple formula um, is the, you take the standard inner product on on C3, on R3, and complexify it to C3, and you take the, the homogeneous coordinates for S and inner product them with the gradient of F. Okay. So this is a, a vector whose coordinates are degree two polynomials, and when you inner product them with S, you get a linear combination of such. This is a degree two polynomial. Its intersection with this degree three polynomial is six points, and they're the six points of tangency. There's a similar formula for the co-critical points, but it's a little more complicated.
Now for typical S, this polar is, is smooth. But if you're very careful about how you choose S, if S happens to be in the zero locus of the Hessian of F, which is just the uh, determinant of the matrix of second order partials, then the polar is singular. And in fact, it's a union of two lines. So for typical S, there are six of, of these dawn points, and you can't really distinguish them. But, um, uh, but if S happened to be on this Hessian curve, then the polar splits into two groups of three, um, corresponding to, so now we can label the points as dawn and dusk. And the, the copoints, Uh, for or the codon points associated to L1 form a configuration configuration P uh, that ha uh, that has the property that AP lies in F. It's a little hard to draw an exact picture on the board of that, so I did an exact picture here. So this is one of these codon configurations. So um, here's my plane cubic, A. I chose a pretty random example. Um, and, and here's the Hessian of A. This orange curve is the Hessian. So if I take a sun and place it on the Hessian, then there are three three lines corresponding to critical values of projection from S that happen to be tangent to the, to the curve. And their points of tangency are, because S lied on, the, on this um, Hessian, they actually form a line. That's the, the dawn line. Um, and then the, the, that implies actually that the co-critical points are also lie on, the, on a line, and that's the, the codon, the locus of codon points. So now I've described to you how to take a plane cubic and come up with a curve's worth of configurations of three points on it. Okay. And as I, as I move A, the, the polynomial defining A, and the, the location of the sun, I sweep out a complex surface. So the picture you should have in mind is we've got F. It has a map to M1, just by forgetting the configuration of three points. And if I take a particular point in A, uh, in M1, then the fiber over it is more or less the Hessian of the associated plane cubic. That's, that's the fiber over A. It's not quite true because there, there was the issue of choosing dawn versus dusk, so it's really a degree two cover of the Hessian. On which you can consistently choose the dawn, the dawn line. This is kind of a, a parameterization of the surface F. Um, we can give a more intrinsic definition. Uh, F consists of the configurations AP, subject to the condition that there is a degree three map to P1, subject to the condition that one P is co-critical for pi. And two, P is linearly equivalent to a fiber of pi. 
linearly equivalent just means that they, the points lie on a line in the plane cubic model. And the translation between these two definitions is you just uh, think of pi sub s when, when you think of pi. Uh, so the upshot is that uh, F is an irreducible surface Uh, irreducible complex surface in M13. Um, we've called it the flex locus. There was actually vigorous debate over what to call it, but we decided the codon locus was a little too cute. Oh, yeah. I'm taking the co-critical points. I take the, I take the green points. Yep. Yeah. So, I, so to each sun I get a collection of green points, and I, as I move the sun, the green points move around. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so we're taking the codon, the codon points. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is, are you not happy with this? Uh, what, what was that? Oh, well, how, how do you take a point in M13 and come up with the embedding? You look at the linear system associated to P. Okay, so really this is a very natural setting in which to study points in M13. Whenever you have three points on a genus one Riemann surface, you get, a, you get an automatic uh, embedding into the plane on which, in which they lie on a line. Okay? Um, and if you believe that, then, then asking for them to be arranged in this way becomes a little more intrinsic. But this, this, is, this, this, does not make, this does not make reference to the plane model. It just says there is a degree three map, which you can later extend to. Uh, well, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how to phrase this without, I mean, we, we have several other alternate definitions, um, but none of them are very obvious from this. And I, I do view this as kind of an, this is just referring to the complex geometry of A and how the locus of P sits. And there's no extrinsic uh, information here, I, I, I think. Um, uh, pi also plays a, se a central role, uh, as, will, as will come later, um, when we talk about quadratic differentials. Um, we call it the flex locus because if you think about the zeros of the Hessian, those are, those are the flexes of F um, as points in C3. So the claim is that this surface, this flex locus, is a totally geodesic subvariety of M13. To convince you of that, I need to tell you a bit about geodesics in moduli space, and of course, quadratic differentials. So now we're going to consider the bundle over M13, whose fiber over AP is the vector space QAP, consisting of integrable polymorphic or uh, meromorphic quadratic differentials on A. Um, which are holomorphic in the complement of P. Uh, 
Uh, integrable here just means the poles are all simple. And they're only allowed to be at P because it's got to be holomorphic on the complement of P. The reason this is a relevant space is because QM13 is naturally isomorphic to the cotangent space, to moduli space. And there's this wonderful SL2R action on QM13, um, whose orbits project to the complex geodesics I referred to earlier. Um, and if you prefer the language of translation surfaces, any particular quadratic differential in here gives AP the structure of a translation surface, or more precisely, a half translation surface. Um, and it can be presented as a union of polygons, and you can just hit all those polygons by an element of SL2R, and that, that gives you the action. Um, okay, so if I'm going to claim to you that F is um, totally geodesic, I should give you a locus of quadratic differentials generating differentials, generating uh, SL2R orbits and, and complex geodesics, which happen to lie in F. So the definition is UF consists of triples A, P, and Q, uh, where A and P happen to lie in F, um, and uh, pi satisfies, did I erase my definition already? Oh, no, I didn't. Satisfies one and two, uh, and um, the, uh, zeros of, the zeros of Q form a fiber of pi. So the fibers of, there's a one complex dimensional family of fibers of pi. So there's a one complex dimensional family of location, possible locations for the zeros of Q. And combined with the scaling action, that means there's a two dimensional fiber over any given AP. So we get a fiber bundle structure. A, a typical AP has a C2's worth of such quadratic differentials. So we get a fiber bundle like this. And in particular, QF. Uh, is irreducible of complex dimension four. Now our main theorem follows easily from the theorem uh, QF is SL2R invariant. And the implication is just um, uh, transport the SL2R orbits complex geodesics math. If you believe that this is SL2R invariant, then each quadratic differential here generates a complex geodesic in F because it remains in QF, which all projects down to F. Um, and at any point in F, I've given you a two-dimensional space of directions to go, which is a, which is a dimension of the space of F. So this, this shows F is totally geodesic. What's that? Primitivity um, is, is not obvious. Uh, Although it's not that hard. So in any M13, the, the primitive, the non-primitive example, there are finitely many prominent non-primitive examples. Uh, and you can directly verify that, that this locus of quadratic differentials can't arise in that way. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss that um, at the end, of, the end of the proof. So strictly speaking, this will prove it minus the primitivity uh, uh, assumption. But, but, we, but uh, I'll discuss that once we complete the proof that it's um, totally geodesic.
So a, a very useful thing to do to a locus of quadratic differentials or half translation surfaces is to pass to covers um, on which they're actually translation surfaces, they're, where, they're or, where their associated foliations or half translation structures are actually orientable. Um, and that process, there's a well-known process for doing that, and that's uh, by taking the square roots of quadratic differentials. So given any Q in QAP, it may or may not be the case that Q is actually the square of a holomorphic one form on A, uh, but whether it is or not, there is a square root x omega where x is a Riemann surface, probably of higher genus. Um, and omega is a holomorphic one form. And this process basically takes Q and makes it orientable. So, um, with, so th this pair has the property that there's a two, two to one map from X to A uh, and the pullback of Q is equal to omega squared. And, yes? Uh, over the odd order of zeros and the poles. Yeah. Yes, but for simple poles, it all it all works. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, the anyhow, I mean, I could write a formula, but it probably wouldn't be very enlightening at the at the moment. It's a beautiful formula, but but there's a, there's a um, yeah, it, it it works with simple poles. Um, if you like, the simple pole in the flat structure has cone angle pi. When you branch over, you get cone angle two pi. I not it's no longer a zero. Um, and the key point, the reason this is relevant to this discussion is the square root is SL2R equivariant. So if I want to show QF is SL2R invariant, it's enough to show all the square roots are SL2R invariant. So um, let's uh, define omega G to be the locus of square roots, X omega where x omega is the square root of aq uh, for aq, apq in this qf. And I'm going to impose just a, gener a generic condition. Um, uh, there are three zeros of q. So this. This, this Riemann surface is a degree two cover of A branched over, when there are three zeros of Q, there are three points P. It's a total of six branch points. This is a genus four Riemann surface. So this is a sublocus of omega M4. Uh, the Hodge bundle over in genus four, the locus of abelian differentials in genus four. Um, and in fact, the, by um, enforcing that the, there be three zeros of Q, I, I restrict myself to a particular stratum in omega um, M4, the locus where the differential omega has three double zeros. Okay. Generic one form has six simple zeros, but each of these square roots has three double zeros. So this is the Hodge bundle. or a stratum thereof. Now, the, now a stratum like this has uh, period coordinates. Uh, locally modeled on.
on the vector space, h1x relative to the zeros of omega with coefficients in c uh, near the point x omega in omega g. And the map is just, um, uh, if you give me an omega prime that happens to be near omega, I just send it to its cohomology class in this uh, vector space. This is, this is a nice system of coordinates on this, on this stratum of abelian differentials. Uh, it's so nice that the, the transition maps are all R linear, or even Q linear. Um, and the SL2R action uh, is, is the obvious one. on uh, writing, rewriting H1 x zero, this cohomology group. So this is, some, this is isomorphic to C to the n for some n, which is R plus IR to the n, because there's a canonical real structure, which is just R squared to the n. And then an element in SL2R acts on R2 in the obvious way by a linear transformation, and you're just taking the diagonal action of SL2R. So the theorem that QF is a SL2R invariant follows very easily from the theorem that omega g is locally defined by R linear equations in period coordinates. So once you write down your, your, an open set in the stratum locally modeled on R squared to the n, the, uh, the, locus, the locus we've defined, this omega g, uh, is cut out by linear, just R linear equations in this, in this real vector space. And if you be believe that the SL2R action is really just the obvious one here, it's clear that it will preserve the, that linear subspace, um, and, and the locus becomes SL2R invariant. So this is... Um, uh, so omega g is SL2R invariant um, uh, as an elementary consequence, uh, as the elementary converse to a famous theorem uh, by Eskin Mertzikhani. And Philippe. Um, so I, I mean, the, what I just said proves to you that a, 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 a locus defined by real linear equations in period coordinates is SL2R invariant, and they've proven the, the very not obvious con, uh, converse, that every SL2R invariant locus is actually a subvariety of the Hodge bundle defined by a linear equations in period coordinates. And then once we know that omega g is SL2R invariant, we know that QF is SL2R invariant because square root is equivariant. And, and omega g is just obtained from QF by taking all the square roots. Okay, so if I'm going to convince you that omega g is defined by really linear equations and period coordinates, we need to figure out how to read off period relations. And the key to doing this is something a little bit mysterious called the mystery torus. So uh, let, let's count dimensions for a second. So QF 
in QM13. Um, M13 is three-dimensional, so QM13 is six-dimensional. F is two-dimensional, QF was four-dimensional, so this is co-dimension two. Okay. So by my count, I owe you two period relations. I need to explain two equations. on the periods of x omega in omega g. Uh, which are not explained independent of by the fact that omega g is contained within this locus of square roots to extra conditions. Okay, so let me, let me tell you how to see that. So let's fix an APQ in our QF and a solar configuration. Uh, a is a zero of a plane cubic, a sun, a pi equals pi s, um, solar configuration. Um, this, this picture implies that there are polynomials, linear polynomials, uh, L, I, Z, C, D, uh, such that, um, well, so P, the, the look is P is, let's call it P1, P3. So uh, the zeros of Li uh, is just the line between Pi and S, those red lines. Um, the intersection of A with the zeros of Z are the zeros of Q. Uh, the intersection of A with the zeros of C is the, uh, is the P, the codon line. For the poles of Q. And A intersect the zeros of D are is the is the Dom locus. So here's here's a picture of that. So the only extra information is now we have this line Z recording the zeros the zeros of Q. So we've got L1, L2, L3. They're the, they're the lines connecting the sun to the, to the marked points. We've got the line D, which is connecting all the associated critical points, and the line C, which is connecting all the associated co-critical points. Um, so, what, so what picture do we have? We've got our Riemann surface A. It's got a, this degree three map, pi to P1, which remember is the lines through S. And we've got this degree two cover, X. X omega is the square root of AQ. Uh, I can form from this whole picture a torus, the mystery torus, by taking the two to one map to P1 branched over four, I need to branch it over four points. Um, and I've got four points going through the sun. I have four lines through the, going through the sun there. So L, I, and Z. So the, the claim which will explain the period relations is that this diagram can be completed.
why do the, that, that was a definition of QF. So the, uh, the, the, that the zeros of Q lie on a fiber of pi. Yeah? Other questions? Um, so the proposition is there is a degree three map from X to B, holomorphic, uh, making this, the square commute. Okay. Um, and I hope to convince you that you can sort of see this fact. This is not such a complicated fact. You can kind of see it from this figure. Because if you think where the map X goes to P1 is branched, it's totally branched over the intersections with those four lines. And therefore, at least it has a good shot of lifting to B. Uh, but the proof of this proposition is obtained as follows. So first, we're going to dehomogenize P1 uh, using the polynomial C. And to show we get this map to B, what we want to show is that the product L1 times L2 times L3 times Z over C to the 4, to dehomogenize it, has a square root in the field of meromorphic functions Uh, on X. Okay. Uh, well, let's look at our quadratic differential. The quadratic differential, um, it's supposed to have zeros at Z and poles at C. So it's actually Z over C times the square of the holomorphic one form. Okay. And that implies that to, to form X, uh, the, the function you get in addition to the normal functions on A is precisely a square root of Z over C. So that implies that the square root of Z over C is a meromorphic function on X. In fact, the field of meromorphic functions uh, on X is obtained from the field of meromorphic functions on A by just adjoining this one square root. It's exactly what you need to be able to take a square root of this, of this quadratic differential. Uh, but moreover, on A, the polynomial L1, L2, L3, it's the union of those three lines, the three red lines. Uh, what is it doing? It's meeting, uh, it's meeting the curve A at each of the yellow points to points of order two, each of the points on D to points of order two, and it's meeting the curve along the line C uh, to points of order one, to, to order one. So um, up to adding functions which are zero on A, the product L1 times L2 times L3 is just D squared times C. Up to adding uh, multiples of the, po the homogeneous polynomial little f, um, this is, this is true. Um, and now, now what we wanted to show is very easy. So L1, L2, L3, Z over C to the 4 is D squared C, Z over C to the 4, which is Z over C times D squared, times D over C squared. Uh, Z over C is a square on X, and D over C squared is a square on X. So this is a square on X. And that, and that shows this function has a square root in the field of meromorphic functions on X. So that, that proves this proposition. Um, and then this implication is pretty easy. OK. So the zeros of Q, um, they were equal by, by hypothesis to a fiber of pi. And that implies that zeros of omega uh, equals a fiber of p. Th 
right, the, the zeros of um, the the zeros of omega come from the zeros of Q, and they're all mapping to this one critical value point uh, for the for the map from B to P one. Um, and so, if I take the push forward of omega to to B, I get a holomorphic one form on B that has a zero at the, at this fiber. But a holomorphic one form on B with a single zero is actually identically zero. And this is exactly the type of thing that gives you period, linear period relations. So this says that the image of the induced map on homology uh, obtained by, you first take the induced map on homology, the normal induced map on the homology, which typically goes the other way, and then you take its dual uh, via the symplectic form. The, the whole image of this has zero omega periods. If I take a cycle in the image of this map, I get a cycle uh, on x whose period in omega is zero. And since this is a two-dimensional space, I get a two-dimensional space of linear conditions on the periods of omega, explaining why these x's of omegas are locally defined by our linear equations and period coordinates. About that? So to, to, uh, to address uh, the question which was raised earlier, so, I, so this, this shows that F is totally geodesic in M13. Let me, let me address primitivity. Um, I said uh, covering constructions uh, give rise to totally geodesic E and MGN. I said before that V is commensurable with um, uh, with a with a different moduli space. In particular, the universal cover, or the universal cover of a normalization, is isomorphic to a traditional Teichmuller space. Okay, so this is a biholomorphic, equivalently um, isometric. Polymorphic and isometric. So, as I said, you, you can see in, by pretty elementary means that that this f is not a totally uh, is not a uh, is not not primitive is primitive um, uh, by just enumerating all the possibilities for this and checking it's not one of those. But we showed a much stronger version of this. Um, because, because it's totally possible that even though F is primitive, its universal cover is still some traditional Teichmuller space. In fact, the, the universal cover of the normalization of F is not isomorphic to any traditional Teichmuller space. And to, to prove this theorem, we we adapted a technique pioneered by Royden for studying maps between Teichmuller spaces. Of that other theorem. Um, so the, dimen the complex dimension of F is two. And there's, a, there's only one two-dimensional Teichmuller space. Uh, so it's enough to show um, that F Quiddles is not holomorphic or isometric to T05. There's, you might think there's another one, T12, but T12 happens to be isomorphic to T05. It's the one coincidence. 
So we're going to use a technique of Royden for studying maps between Teichmuller spaces. Um, so Royden showed that for every a prime p prime in t05, uh, the Teichmuller norm, the norm associated to the Finsler metric, the Teichmuller metric, uh, on the cotangent space which is canonically isomorphic to the space of quadratic differentials. He showed it's uh, C infinity, in fact analytic, in the complement of five lines. Um, and it's not C2 on those five lines. And the, the lines are pretty simple to describe. A typical differential here has five poles and one zero, but there are five lines in which one of the poles and one of the zeros collide, and you get four poles and no zeros. So there are five lines in here, um, and the norm is C infinity on the complement of those five lines, but it's not C2 uh, on those lines. Um, and in this way, this was a key ingredient to proving the biholomorphic automorphism group of Teichmuller space uh, is the mapping class group and no larger. So to, to show that F is not, F twiddles is not isomorphic to any traditional Teichmuller space, uh, we showed that for typical, Um, AP and F twiddles, the, uh, the locus of differentials, the restriction of the Teichmuller norm to the cotangent space to F twiddles, which is this locus of quadratic differentials whose zeros lie at a fiber of pi, um, is not C2 on the union of six lines. Um, in fact, it's the lines uh, in QAP pi, uh, which intersect the strata of differentials minus one cubed one, two, uh, and the stratum minus one squared, zero, two. Okay. So the, as you move Z around, there are six special locations for Z where Z has fewer um, f higher order zeros. And using the same techniques as Reusen, you can show that, that the, the Teichmuller norm is not C2 along those lines. And so if you're going to give me a holomorphic isomorphism from F twiddles to T05, it will give me an isometry between these two spaces, but they can't even infinitesimally be isometric because this, their regularity doesn't, doesn't really match up. Okay, that looks like a good place to stop. Thanks. Thanks.